I have breaking news for you. This is going to be a shorter video. Yay! Okay. Today we are going to discuss schizoid and cerebral narcissist. And we are going to discuss something that bothers you a lot, that you can't wrap your heads around, that you keep quizzically trying to decipher to no avail. How come the schizoid or the cerebral narcissist lets his partner cheat on him consensually? How come he allows his partner to be, in, if he's a heterosexual male, how come he allows his partner to be with other men? Isn't this narcissistic injury? Why does he sometimes push her to be with other men? Isn't it a challenge to his grandiosity? Well, a challenge to grandiosity, narcissistic injury, and even mortification depend crucially on the locus of the grandiosity, where the grandiosity resides. If you think you're a genius and someone challenges your intellect or your intellectual capability and accomplishments, that would be narcissistic injury. But if you don't care about love, you don't understand or never experienced intimacy, and you don't particularly like sex, or you like sex, but you know, like people, like other people like caviar once in five years, then it doesn't matter to you. If your partner misbehaves with other men, that's not a challenge to your grandiosity. Somatic narcissists, on the other hand, are going to react very badly to the very same behavior or misbehavior by their intimate partners, because the locus of grandiosity of the somatic narcissist is between his legs and his sexual prowess, conquests, his body. So somatic narcissists are bodybuilders. They hone and nurture their bodies as weapons, instruments of war. And so the schizoid and cerebral narcissists honestly don't care if their partners end up sleeping around or having long-term love affairs or casual one-night stands. It simply is not within the remit of their grandiosity. And the most precious thing to the narcissist is to buttress, protect, preserve his grandiosity. That is his life. That's where he comes alive, when his grandiosity somehow manifests or, on the other hand, is challenged. Got it, Bonbonim? Now, of course, as usual, I'm going to go into details, but not before I drink from my mini. You see, Minnie cheats on me with other mugs. I found her in flagrante. Now, whatever I'm going to say to you in this video lecture is based on my famous, by now, database of 1,912 people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. To be included in my database, you have to provide a letter from your therapist, from the diagnostician, confirming that you had been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder and no other comorbidities. And then you are subjected to a questionnaire of close to 700 questions. This, the, the answers to these questions are put in a database and once a year you um, are supposed to respond to follow-up questions. This is by far the largest database in the universe of narcissists. Just to give you a benchmark, most studies of narcissists involve an average of, hold your breath, four people. A study with 20 narcissists is considered to be ginormous. And I have a database with well over 1.1 billion data points, that's billion, not million, data points involving almost 2,000 certifiable narcissists, kosher narcissists. So, whatever I'm going to tell you right now is based on a follow-up questionnaire that I had sent to 120 self-described schizoid narcissists. Of these, 89 had answered. I've amalgamated the questions and the answers. Additionally, I myself am a schizoid cerebral narcissist, so I was able to vet the answers. I was able to see where the answers deviated from what I happen to know from personal experience, and I was able to add my personal experience into the mix. But what you're about to hear is not autobiographical only. It is based on a relatively large sample 
of schizoid cerebral narcissists from well over 34 countries. And of course, different cultures and different societies. So stay tuned. This is a trip in every sense of the word. This is entering the twilight zone. I mean, the reasons we give, the logic, the, the reasoning, the, 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 I mean, it's, it's inhuman. It's transhuman. It's, I don't know what to call it anymore. Um, you have never come across people like this. I mean, your initial response would be to say, well, they're psychos. It's not a question of being a psycho. There is rhyme and reason to all this. And I'm about to insert the key, turn it, turn it, and open the door for you. So, enjoy the show. Cheating. Why I allow my partners to cheat on me. First of all, we need to go back to the topic of shared fantasy. The narcissist's ability to engage in a shared fantasy rests on three pillars. There are three conditions. Environment, circumstances, the right partner. Start with the environment. The environment, environment has to be rootless. It has to be an environment where the narcissist is not, is not attached. He's not, he's not bonded to the environment. An environment that is easy to discard. It has to be fantastic. It has to be dreamlike in order to uphold this grandiosity. The environment has to be timeless, an eternal present, so that actions do not bear consequences. When you don't have a future, nothing you do right now will have consequences because there's no future. So it's a license. It's a liberating license to misbehave or behave or do whatever you want to do because there's no tomorrow. Carpe diem. And finally, the environment has to be boundless. There should be no limit to what can be done and what can be accomplished. Circumstances. Circumstances ought to be right. When you have the right environment, the right circumstances, and the right partner, you can put them together and create a shared fantasy. Now, shared fantasy, to remind you, is not my invention. <laughs> shared fantasy is a cl clinically accepted entity, clinically accepted um, construct. First described by F. Sander, S-A-N-D-E-R, in 1989. Watch my previous videos. So the circumstances have to be right. They have to be conducive to grandiose fantasies by yielding lots of money, lots of sex, lots of power, lots of access, lots of fame, celebrity, notoriety. And all this has to be accomplished effortlessly with no commensurate investment or commitment. Think Harvey Weinstein. The partner in the shared fantasy has to be present. In order to avoid abandonment anxiety, she has to be present all the time. Not physically, necessarily, but definitely emotionally and mentally. She has to be submissive. She has to be fawning, adulating. She has to be playful. She has to be a bit childlike, immature. And finally, and most importantly by far, she has to be mothering. The narcissist parentifies the intimate partner within the shared fantasy. She has to be mothering. If it's business or friendship, the other party should be fathering. So it's a parental figure. The intimate partner should be mothering, should provide the narcissist with a good, good enough mother, which he didn't have in his childhood. She should not be a dead mother. And finally, she should be addicted to the narcissist, unable to break loose. So my experience corroborated by well over 89 cases that had bothered to respond to the questionnaire, cases in my database, as well as the literature. Because the literature is very clear on schizoid attachment style, on issues of infidelity, on intimate relationships. I refer you to literature by Fairburn, Guntrip, Seinfeld, Winnicott, you name it. So, Everything I'm about to say is very, very well substantiated, although it's mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. It defies belief. So, in all his relationships, the schizoid narcissist or the cerebral narcissist, and the vast majority of schizoid narcissists are actually cerebral narcissists. So, in all the relationships, the schizoid cerebral... So, from now on, I'm going to say schizoid cerebral narcissist. Okay? In all the, his relationships... The schizoid cerebral narcissist allows his, his intimate partners to be with others as sexual 
or even long-term romantic partners. Now, uh, I'm going to use from, from here on, I'm going to use he for the narcissist and she for his intimate partner. But of course, there are numerous combinations. There are homosexual couples, lesbian couples. There's a situation where the, the, the woman, the feminine side, the female side is the narcissist and the male side is actually the, the other party. So I'm going to use it for convenience sake, but it applies to all possible combinations. So in all his relationships, the schizoid cerebral narcissist allows his partners and sometimes encourages them to be with other men as sexual or even long-term romantic partners. He, on the other hand, is forbidden to have any contact whatsoever with women unless his partner is, pr is present and she could terminate the meeting at any time. So his partner maintains full control over his access to potential intimate, potential other potential intimate partners. He gives up his sex life, his contact with women, even his social life. His partner is given a free hand. She can do anything, anything she wants. She can screw around, she can sleep around, she can disappear for days, she can come back in the morning, she can do absolutely anything she wants. What kind of arrangement is this? It's a very lopsided doormat arrangement. It's a total suspension of boundaries. These narcissists are not are unboundaried. They don't have boundaries. Why do they why do they agree to such a deal where the partner has full liberty to misbehave? This is no other word. To misbehave in any way she sees fit. And the narcissist actually in this equation has no right, no right to be in touch with people, let alone women. He is a prisoner, in effect. He's a hostage. It's a hostage situation. Why would anyone agree to this? Now, mind you, this is not the overt narcissist. This is not the covert narcissist. This is a highly specific sub-sub-subtype, the schizoid cerebral narcissist, a loner, a loner who sits alone at home, reads books, surfs the internet, watches movies, eats and goes to sleep, rarely talks to other people, never socializes, never communicates with women because his wife or his girlfriend or his lover forbids it. And she forbids it even as she is having long-term affairs, even as she is having one night stands and even as she comes back home at five or seven o'clock in the morning, having had a night out with a man often often ostentatiously in the presence of the narcissist. Why would anyone agree to such a manifestly sick arrangement? Well, because he's sick. Let's, let me give you the reasons enumerated by these individuals who had answered the questionnaire and supported fully by my own experience. In all my relationships, all my women, I've had this arrangement with all my women. And all, my, all the women in my life, intimate partners in my life, had slept with other men and had affairs with other men and had misbehaved with other men in a variety of other ways. And I fully accepted it. And at the same time, I accepted restrictions and limitations and prohibitions on my own behavior. For example, I was not allowed to be in touch with women um, in any way, shape or form, unless my intimate partner was present and was able to terminate the interaction. So I'm one of these cases. Okay, here are the reasons that people gave and that I, I concur with and, and support from my personal experience. Number one, in order to persevere and survive within the narcissist increasingly more sexless fantasy, the woman has to meet her sexual and emotional needs with men, real men. The so narcissist is not a real man by any extension of the word <laughs> by any definition and by any interpretation of this word the narcissist is not it he's not a man he is intermittently a child he sometimes is a guru and sometimes he's a father figure but he's never an adult man so the woman finds herself trapped with a child and most of the time with a child and sometime with a very harsh and disciplinarian father guru figure and she needs a man 
she wants a man she craves she craves what a man can give physically and emotionally so the schizoid cerebral narcissist realizes his deficiencies and allows allows his partner to outsource her needs to go outside the marriage to gratify the needs that he cannot never ever provide love intimacy sex attention companionship acceptance warmth compassion affection okay number two as long as there are no indications of imminent abandonment the schizoid cerebral narcissist doesn't care if his intimate partner is with other men um, but she the intimate partner does feel hurt does feel insecure if the schizoid cerebral narcissist were to have any interaction with other women it's like the schizoid cerebral narcissist says i don't care if she's with other men but she cares if i'm with other women so you know i will not be with other women i will not hurt her i will not hurt her feelings and i will not make her feel insecure when she misbehaves with other men it's okay with me and now signs of imminent abandonment include usually change in behavior there are the warning there are warning signs they're usually red flags which precede the actual abandonment or actual breakup so changes in attitude changes in mood changes in behaviors so uh, suddenly the, the intimate partner becomes indifferent or disrespectful or deceptive i will discuss all this later when these signs kick in the cerebral schizoid narcissist becomes very possessive not romantically jealous never but possessive and again we'll come to it a bit later the third reason why a cerebral schizoid narcissist would allow his wife for example to be with other men is that he feels that he should be grateful to her for any time she spends with him for any dedication of resources to his needs he, fe he feels that he is so broken so damaged so inadequate that her very presence the very presence of the intimate partner in his life is a sacrifice on her part she's sacrificing a lot by being with him she's doing him a huge favor so he has no right and he's not in a position to establish boundaries or rules and then to enforce them you know you don't check a gift horse in the mouth or anywhere else for that matter don't try it at home reason number four she she's an adult and the cerebral schizoid narcissist is not an adult so she needs mature conventional reciprocated and regular sex and intimacy the schizoid cerebral narcissist does not need intimacy and sex of any kind the the intimate partners of the schizoid cerebral narcissist are actually single they are what i call virtual singles and they they are ensconced they are cocooned they are trapped with a petulant child or with a stern father at home and so dating others is the only outlet and the only escape for these women because what's the alternative a child at home a father having sex with a child or a father is incestuous it's out of the question these women are very sex averse they can't even imagine touching the schizoid narcissist let alone sleeping with him they cut off the sex when the shared fantasy starts and they refuse to sleep with the schizoid cerebral narcissist because it's disgusting he is disgusting he's not a man in any sense he's kind of an alien alien entity if you wish a reptile the fifth reason is is that the schizoid cerebral narcissist can have sex initially at least only within a shared fantasy so if he were to to have sex if he were to seek intimacy he would need to go out of the marriage out of the relationship and establish a new relationship the intimate partner of the schizoid cerebral narcissist usually can compartmentalize compartmentalize means she can have sex with other men she can have love affairs with other men they could be even long and serious and intimate and deep but she will never abandon the schizoid cerebral narcissist as a child for example she would always cater to his needs she would always be there for him out of pity out of 
compassion, out of attachment, out of addiction, never mind for what reason. This, as long as a cerebral somatic narcissist is convinced that she will never leave him, he is content to let her have a parallel double life with another man, to gratify her needs for a male presence and anything and everything a man can give a woman elsewhere, because he can't, and actually he doesn't want to. Even if he could, he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to. So he, if he were to decide to become normal, so to speak, and have sex and intimacy, he would need to, to, to have a new relationship. And she doesn't have to have a new relationship. Or if she does have a new relationship, she would still come back to cater to the needs of the schizoid cerebral narcissist. And anyhow, if the schizoid cerebral narcissist were to go and seek a new relationship, a new shared fantasy, what good would it do? What good would it do? Any new shared fantasy will end, end the same way. Any new shared fantasy will end the very same way the previous shared fantasies had ended, with sex sexlessness, with cheating, with acrimony. So why bother? Why bother to have a new shared fantasy when, you ha when, when the, the narcissist already has a shared fantasy? Yes, within this shared, existing shared fantasy, he has no sex, he has no intimacy, and really he has no love, at least not as a man, had he been a man. And his, his um, intimate partner, his spouse, his girlfriend, his lover, is all over the place with other men. And it's humiliating. It's humiliating. It's shameful, it's shaming, it's, it's a hard thing to countenance, but what's the alternative? Exit the existing shared fantasy, start a new shared fantasy and find yourself in the same situation three years down the road, usually three months down the road. What's the point in this? As long as the narcissist is getting supply, as long as he's getting services, however gr grudgingly, however meager, better stay put. Better to forget everything about sex and intimacy and love, because they're out of reach, they're unattainable, they're just a pipe dream. The next reason is that only mentally ill, broken, damaged and traumatized women are likely to be attracted to the schizoid cerebral narcissist. Only these kind of women are likely to enter the sh a new shared fantasy. And such women pose serious risks. They are dysregulated. They're labile, they're impulsive, they're reckless. There's a risk of exposure. There's a risk of blackmail. There's a risk of suicide. There's a risk of criminal liability. Who needs this? Who needs all this? At least the existing shared fantasy is safe. It's secure. It's firewalled. The world out there is threatening and menacing, which is one of the main reasons schizoid are loners and stay at home. They're afraid of the world. They're afraid of the pain and hurt the world can inflict upon them. The typical schizoid cerebral narcissist sublimates, sublimates his autoerotic, sadistic, kinky sex drive. Let me explain. Sublimation is a word coined by Freud to describe the conversion of an urge or a drive into socially acceptable forms. So you, you want to do something, it's not done, you shouldn't do it, consequences will be bad. So you take this energy and you change it into something socially acceptable. So for example, you want to have sex and instead of having sex, you write a book. Instead of having sex, you engage in politics. That's sublimation. There's a lot of energy. This energy goes into something else. Forget sex, forget women, forget everything. So the cerebral schizoid narcissist successfully sublimates his sex drive. He really, really, honestly, prefers to learn things, to read books, to surf the internet, to, to cater to his, to tend to his collections, or to watch movies. He finds these things much more gratifying and interesting than being with, with a woman or having sex. He's usually also bored. People bore the typical schizoid cerebral narcissist, because schizoid cerebral narcissists have, have, have a very high IQ. And they find people dull and boring and excruciatingly stupid. So 
gradually they gravitate into this solitary solipsistic position and they find solitary activities to be the name of the game. They love them. They love to do things by their own. They love to control time and space totally. And what about the biological drive? Well, the biological drive is satisfied with porn and masturbation. The psychosexual kink or even sadism that characterizes schizoid cerebral narcissism does require a live body. But the schizoid cerebral narcissist makes a calculus of pros and cons and reaches a conclusion that the price of kinky sex is not worth the price of pursuing women and then ending up in a shared fantasy exactly in the place, in the same place, in, in, in square one, in ground zero. So what schizoid cerebral narcissists do, they suppress the sex drive. They suppress the urge for intimacy and the overwhelming need for love. They suppress all this. And exactly like pedophiliacs, for example, practitioners of some paraphilias, they, they simply tend to bury their drive. But they bury also the emotional concomitants of the drive. So they bury not only their psychosexuality, they bury also, they bury also love, the potential for love or the potential for intimacy. Their lives are lonely and barren, like a huge, I call it intimacy desert. Additionally, if the schizoid cerebral narcissist is also sadistic, which is a tiny minority, but it does exist, if he's sadistic, rejecting women, frustrating women, and humiliating women, especially publicly, by, by um, not responding to sexual advances, for example, this, these acts, these sadistic pleasures, this pain inflicted on women, feels much better than sex actually. And finally, the last point, why schizoid cerebral narcissists allow cheating, legitimize consensually cheating within their relationships, actually sometimes push the partner to cheat in collusive infidelity. Why they do this, allowing the partner to cheat restores their, their delusion of being in control. Yes, she's cheating, but I told her to cheat. Yes, she's cheating, but she tells me everything about it. Yes, she's cheating, but I'm in control. Yes, she's cheating, but I drove her. I, I, I. It restores grandiosity. Anyhow, the intimate partner of a schizoid cerebral narcissist will end, will end up cheating. Cheating is inevitable and overwhelmingly um, abundant and prevalent in relationships with schizoid cerebral narcissists. So why not to put the base face on it? Why not to initiate it? Why not to preempt it? So that you can tell yourself, convince, lie to yourself convincingly that you were the one who had, who had started it all. That she would not have cheated had it not been for you. So you are still the master. You're still in control. Cerebral schizoid narcissists are therefore, as I said before, unboundaried. They never set boundaries in any of their relationships, by the way. Not only romantic relationships. They let their partners behave and misbehave in every which way. They afford the partners unmitigated, anarchic freedoms and a complete lack of scrutiny. Even when all the partners had abused these privileges with ostentatious and egregious serial cheating, for example, the schizoid cerebral narcissist never protests, never restrains them. Girlfriends, spouses, mates, find this state of things absolutely beyond the pale. They don't know how to cope with it. They don't even know how to understand it. They resent this benign neglect. This, it feels like indifference. It feels like the schizoid cerebral narcissist doesn't care, doesn't mind. It doesn't feel like the schizoid cerebral narcissist is giving them any special liberty or is interested in their well-being and welfare. He doesn't feel like that. He feels like he simply doesn't care where they are, who they are with, and what they're doing. And so they can't get a rise. They can't get even a modicum of attention out of, this, of the narcissist, no matter how bad their escalated misconduct becomes. 
Schizoid cerebral losses are infuriating in their unflap unflappability and sang froid. This unflappable and implacable posture engenders a lot of uncertainty in the tortured minds of the schizoid cerebral narcissist's ostensible intimates. They ask themselves, could he truly love me? Does he truly love me? Because if he, if he had loved me, he would have never let me pick up a man in front of him and go out into the night. It seems like he doesn't care. He doesn't love me. And if he does love me, why does he never set rules? Why does he never intervene? Why does he never protest? Why does he never fight with me? Why does he never restrain me? Never mind to what extent I disrespect him in private or even in public. He is unmovable, unshakable. A sphinx, a stone. Is it apathy? Is he apathetic? apathetic? Is he really indifferent? Or is it actually a form of passive aggression? They don't know what to, what to make of it. Gradually, the intimate partner of the schizoid cerebral narcissist no longer can regard this type of narcissist as a man. Real men are somewhat possessive, somewhat romantically jealous. I mean, taken to extreme, it's a pathology, but some grain of possessiveness, some grain of romantic jealousy goes hand in hand with sexual exclusivity in a typical relationship. Real men are like that. And real men are definitely boundary. But the cerebral, the cerebral schizoid narcissist is not possessive. He's never romantically jealous. He's spineless. He's also genderless. It's, he's like a total doormat. He lacks all the features of anything remotely resembling a man. So they gradually can't see him as a man. His obsequiousness repels them. They're disgusted by his obsequiousness, spinelessness. They get angry at his avoidance. The intimate partner of, partners of the schizoid cerebral narcissist become extremely sex averse. They cut off all sex with the schizoid cerebral narcissist. They start to sleep around in order to cater to the most basic of their unmet needs, intimacy, love, emotionality, sex, with a man, any man, just a man. <laughs> they are man hungry. They crave a man after three years with a schizoid cerebral narcissist or even three months. Living with a schizoid cerebral narcissist is not like being in a, in a romantic dyad or in a couple. It's like being with a, non, with a nothingness, with a non-entity, with an emptiness, with a void. It's, it's harrowing. It's absolute, I've, I've, heard, I've heard descriptions from victims that are, that are, you know, they're speechless, simply. So the, the, the partners of the schizoid cerebral narcissist are not choosing other men because he's not a man. They're not choosing other men over the men that they had committed to. It's not like they had committed to the cerebral schizoid narcissist and now they're choosing another man. It's not men versus men. It's men versus nothing. They're not choosing another man. They're choosing a man. They choose actual virility over nothingness. They choose actual masculinity over absence. The entity back home, which is, is neither a man nor, frankly, human. These intimate partners, crying usually, in very bad shape, they don't do it willingly. Their dreams are shattered, their illusions are broken, their fantasies are dead. They're in horrible shape. But they have, they're compelled to choose presence over absence, actual throbbing life over a pallid simulacrum, and, a war, and warm pulsating bodies of men over the dead flesh of the schizoid cerebral narcissist. The schizoid cerebral narcissist plays two adult roles, but they are fake adult roles. One is a father and one is a guru. And he plays these roles in order to secure the shared fantasy. But these roles are brief. They're, they're context dependent. 
they're triggered by explicit requests. And they're devoid of any true responsibilities, chores, or commitment. The investment in these roles is proportional to the, to the expectations and the benefits that the narcissist derives. He's going to play the father, he's going to play the guru, if there's something in it for him. You know, he's asking, what's in it for me? Uh, he doesn't he doesn't do future faking because he really believes in his own fantasies but it comes very close and it's a small part of the manipulative ploy which also includes delusional role play by everyone involved as the narcissist woman as his intimate partner begins to have emotional and sexual affairs and casual sex with other men the narcissist schizoid cerebral narcissist does not experience shockingly any romantic jealousy actually doesn't experience any emotion if you interrogate these schizoid cerebral narcissists myself included i would tell you they would tell you that the only sensation is relief a sense of relief now i don't have to cater to her demands as a woman now she is someone else's problem she has outsourced the potentially thorny and threatening issue and she had stopped becoming a nuisance. I want to be alone and I want to play because I'm a child and because I'm a schizoid. With a woman gun uh, imposing on another man's time and another man's resources, the schizoid cerebral narcissist have now a regained mastery of his life. He feels euphoric. He feels liberated, you know, like the movie Home Alone, when the child is home alone, when the nagging adults are all gone, that's how he feels when his, his wife is sleeping with another man, when his girlfriend is dating another man, when they're both absent all night and come back drunk in the morning. He still feels elated, he feels relieved, he feels liberated. It's not his problem anymore. Nuisance is busy elsewhere. I'm left to my pleasurable devices and time-consuming vocations or avocations, I can finally be a child and play in the sandbox, unperturbed, unencumbered, and above all, unsupervised. The natural state of the schizoid cerebral narcissist naturally is schizoid. When he is successful, he feels empowered, he feels self-sufficient, and then he feels a bit sadistic. And when he fails, he withdraws in order to avoid narcissistic injuries and mortifications. But he's always, whether a success or a failure, he's always solitary, he's always introverted, and, and generates a constant stream of intellectual self-arousal and self-stimulation. He's alone with his books, in his library, in his study, with his collections, and he is the happiest ever. He's, a, he's happy as a lark. He doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need the intrusion. He doesn't need the imposition. And he fulfills the guru father role only when the woman seeks advice or asks for money. He gives money freely and a lot to buy her off, to bribe her into staying. And so most of these women are transformed willy-nilly, inadvertently and unwillingly, uh, are transformed into effective gold diggers because they're there for the money. They provide services, they get money. And then they finish the day, finish the day's work. They titivate, put makeup, dress provocatively, and go out to hunt for, out for men, for real men. So they don't have, have one at home. Uh, I said that all this is true unless and until the schizoid cerebral narcissist detects signs of imminent hurtful abandonment. And these signs include deception, and he is very good because he has called empathy. He's very good at spotting, detecting, and ferreting out lies. You can't pull the wool over the schizoid cerebral narcissist's eyes. You can't. He knows everything. He knows everything. He often pretends that he doesn't. He often is silent about it because he doesn't care. But trust me, he knows absolutely everything. Much more than you think that he knows. And without spying on you, he's a great mind reader. So, when he spots detection, when he spots indifference, overt disrespect, hatred, spite, vindictiveness, impulsivity, recklessness, 
malice in his intimate partner, he knows she's about to bail out. She's about to abandon sheep. She's about to break up with him. She's about to abandon him. And then he enters panic mode. He catastrophizes and he reacts with rage in very rigid, possessive, boundary setting. Usually way too late, but he does. What is the role of deception or deceptiveness in all this? Deception includes all the famous acts, secret assignations, lies, counterfactual claims of love and amity, abrupt and incomprehensible behavioral alterations, clandestine communication, denial of access to information, secretiveness. These are all hallmarks of deception. And when the narcissist, the schizoid cerebral narcissist, becomes convinced that abandonment is imminent, he, begin, he enters a period of grieving, period of mourning, going through the famous five stages of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Denial, depression, anger. He mourns the demise of the shared fantasy, which was founded on total trust in the mother, and now this trust is irretrievably lost. Mind you, he is not mourning you. He is not mourning the fact that you will be out of his life, gone forever, he will never hear from you again. That's not what he's mourning. He's mourning the shared fantasy. He's mourning the fact that he was so good while it lasted, and now he doesn't last. And he catastrophizes the future deleterious intentions and actions of his intimate partner. Now she becomes a persecutory object, an internal, internalized enemy. Her snapshot is converted, and he demonizes her, devalues her, and anticipates the worst. And he becomes paranoid and very, very defensive. And he begins to do crazy things. And he also becomes very angry. He regards any attempt to lie to him or to deceive him as a challenge to his grandiose omniscience and a sign that he is not as feared, admired, respected, and held in awe as he had imagined himself to be. And when the deceptiveness is evident, even if the intimate partner is deceptive towards others, for example, lies to her lover about him, or lies about her past, he similarly reacts with anxiety and catastrophizes. If she did it to other men, she would do it to me. If she had cheated with me, she will cheat with others, etc., etc. Possessiveness is then, possessiveness then sets in. That's the reaction, not traumatic jealousy. Listen well, the schizoid cerebral narcissist is never ever romantically jealous, but he does become possessive. Possessiveness is driven by terror. Mortification leads to introspection, and romantic jealousy is pain, which results in withdrawal and aversion. These are different things. Possessiveness is abandonment, separation, anxiety, and fear of loss. It's the way the schizoid cerebral narcissist experiences the anticipated rejection and abandonment and breakup. He is terrified of being separated, of being abandoned, because he's a kid. He's two years old. He is before. His mental age, his emotional age is before the separation individuation phase. It's like being abandoned by mother. As long as object constancy is maintained, he doesn't mind if his intimate partner outsources all her sexual and emotional needs. In other words, in other words he doesn't mind if his, if his intimate partner sleeps around with hundreds of men. He doesn't care. He doesn't mind if she has another man with whom she has a very long and very deep and very involved love affair. And she loves that other man and is intimacy with him much more than she loves the narcissist and his intimacy with him. He doesn't care. None of this matters as long as she is there, present physically and mentally. He needs her to not separate. He's terrified of losing her. And when the partner reacts with aggressive defiance to his attempts to hoover her, to reel her in, and to set boundaries, rigid boundaries, when, when she reacts with derision and mockery, when he tries to take possession of her, to reclaim her. She says, now you, now you, <laughs> now you're trying to reclaim me? Now you're trying to set uh, rules? And I mean, the hell with you. I'm, I have my own life by now. And I have a man, another man. And I love him. And, you know, I want to be with him. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to come here. I'm going to service you. But forget about it. You can't limit my freedom. You can't tell me what to do anymore. I'm a free agent. I'm single. And then when this becomes totally clear, the schizoid cerebral narcissist becomes avoidant and dysphoric, and then he's driven to look for a new 
shit fantasy because nothing is left. Absolutely nothing is left. Not even the, not even common decency. The disrespect that the intimate partner shows the schizoid cerebral narcissist at this stage is so profound, so intractable that he understands that he had lost her and he has to go looking for the next partner in the shared fantasy and give her the same, afford her the same liberties that he had afforded and he knows it's doomed as well. He knows he is doomed to doomed relationships and there's extremely little, if anything, he can do about it. Cursed, the mark of Cain,